Making your mitochondria healthier is one of the best things that you can do to protect yourself from viral illnesses, including that pesky one that seems to peak again at the moment that we can't really talk about in the YouTube video without risking getting suppressed by the algorithm, but it rhymes with Mobit. Now, mitochondria, of course, these organelles in our cells that generate energy in the form of ATP to power all cellular functions, but they do a lot more than that. Our mitochondria are crucial for the health of our cells, including the cells of our immune system. Now, improving the health and number of our mitochondria is greatly protective against viral and bacterial illnesses, as well as diabetes, cancer, heart disease, dementia, and autoimmune disorders, so most of the diseases that we know of. I often think of our, our mitochondria as a solar panel roof. Now, electricity is generated here at higher amounts during sunny days, and the system needs to store and absorb this electricity by conducting it through wires to a storage battery or an electric appliance with a high energy consumption, like a pool heater, right? Now, if too much energy is um, generated, the wires can overheat and the battery can get damaged. And this is very similar to our mitochondria. If surges of energy are coming in for prolonged periods of time in the form of high blood glucose, for example, mitochondria will produce a significant amount of free radicals, which is part of their normal energy production. But if these radicals cannot be neutralized to some extent, then the mitochondria may get damaged and release some of the radicals into the cell where they can cause further damage, including in the nucleus. Now, melatonin is a molecule that's produced in the mitochondria to cool the system of energy production by neutralizing free radicals and improving the storage of energy. It is also one of the most powerful antioxidants in the human body. About 95% of all melatonin is produced in our mitochondria and only 5% is contained within the pineal gland of our brain. And this is released around the time we go to sleep. This is what we think of when we talk about the circadian rhythm, you know, the sleep-wake cycle. So the majority of our melatonin is used to decrease free radicals in our mitochondria and in other parts of our cells. And the production of melatonin in our mitochondria can greatly be increased by our exposure to red light and near infrared light. So these frequencies are part of regular sunlight and can be found in LED panels or beds that use red light and near infrared light at around 630 and 850 nanometers. Near infrared light is the warmth that you perceive when you are out in the sunlight. So this penetrates through thin clothing and can even pass through bone into deeper tissues. So when you're out in the sunlight, you know, even uh, it, it, it will go through your skull into your brain. And it is very beneficial for the neurons in our brain because, again, it stimulates the production of melatonin in these cells as well, which then protects the cell. It protects the mitochondria. Now, interestingly, you don't have to have direct sunlight exposure for prolonged periods of time to get sufficient amounts of near infrared light. Near infrared light is reflected of green surfaces. So walking or, you know, sitting in the shades of trees, for example, will still give you sufficient near infrared light exposure without significant UV exposure, which of course can be harmful or burning your skin over time, right? And it's interesting, so in this is one of the things that we don't get enough of these days. So we used to be outdoors a lot more than today. You think back about 100 years, 150 years ago, we spent a lot more time in the sunlight, right? And besides that, we also got some of our infrared light from incandescent light bulbs. Those are the old light bulbs with the filament they produce NIR or near-infrared light. Today, we have LED light bulbs. There's no uh, near-infrared light there. Also, we're using low-energy glass. So this glass, you know, it keeps our houses from heating up because it filters out the near-infrared light. So we're getting a significant amount less today than we used to about 100 years ago. And I think this is one of the issues we have today why we have more diseases. It's one of the things that contributes to our increase in certain diseases and diseases in the population. So anyway, so spending about 20 to 30 minutes outdoors, even in indirect sunlight, can give you sufficient near-infrared radiation to greatly improve the health of your mitochondria. This is quite easy to do. It's something I try to do on a daily basis. So again, the wavelength of the red light, which we can see, is 630 nanometers, and near-infrared light, the optimal frequency is around 850 nanometers, right? And these penetrate very deep into our cells, and they reach the mitochondria and they stimulate the production of melatonin here. Other wavelengths or colors of light do not have this effect, right? Now, aside from decreasing free radicals, melatonin is also involved in decreasing intracellular glucose and thereby blood glucose. So this is very important. So increased sun exposure can actually improve insulin sensitivity and decrease triglycerides. So it has a lot of health benefits. Another molecule that behaves similarly to melatonin actually in terms of its uh, function to neutralize free radicals and to optimize energy production in the mitochondria 
is methylene blue. Now, this is a blue dye that can be used as a supplement with a very high oral uh, bioavailability. So about 90%, I think, gets in when you take it orally. Now, I've done several videos on methylene blue, and um, I explain in there how this really works as a supplement, right? I usually take 10 milligrams of methylene blue four to five days per week. Um, another supplement as we're on the topic is PQQ, which is a nutraceutical or supplement that can help to increase the number of our mitochondria as well as the health of our mitochondria. And this is one of the very underrated supplements in my opinion. Most people don't know about PQQ, but this has amazing health uh, benefits and it actually can decrease also body fat percentage. It's a very interesting one. But PQQ, as far as I'm aware, is the only supplement or the only nutraceutical that actually can increase the number of our mitochondria. Remember, as we get older, we lose mitochondria, so we get less and less mitochondria. And PQQ is one supplement that can improve that again. It can increase that number again. So great supplement. Uh, I take it regularly. I take 20 milligrams daily of PQQ. Uh, continuing on the top of, topic of supplements as we're on here, um, the other supplements that I use that I think have a very positive effect on mitochondrial health are vitamin D3 with K2. And I take about 5,000 international units of D3 with 100 micrograms of K2 daily. I know some people take a lot more. I did a video. Um, there was an interesting case where people took too much of it. There were a few cases in the literature. You can overdose. It's rare. Uh, but if you take upwards of 50,000 or more, of course, that's an issue. Now, none of these um, dosages here and supplements are recommendations for you to take. You should discuss this with your primary care doctor because I don't know your medical history. There might be contraindications on some of these and they might interact with some medications. But personally, I take 5,000 international units of D3 with 100 micrograms of K2. But the K2 is important when we take vitamin D3, especially in large amounts. It um, increases the reabsorption of calcium. And that calcium, if we don't have sufficient vitamin K2, um, is not redirected to bone where it should go, but it can deposit in arteries. So K2 is a very important vitamin to take. It's usually in butter and other things, but I think it's good to consume this as a supplement, right? Now, vitamin D3 is involved in mitochondrial respiration and it decreases inflammation and oxidative stress. So highly supportive of the mitochondria. Another supplement I take is berberine, uh, and this can actually lower blood glucose. Therefore, of course, very protective of the mitochondria, as I talked about before, because it prevents these surges of energy production caused by high blood sugars. So I take 1,500 milligrams of berberine daily. Coenzyme Q10, I take uh, 100 milligrams of that four to five times per week. Now, coenzyme Q10 can help to improve mitochondrial health because it is an electron carrier in the, elect in, in the mitochondrial respiratory chain. And it's also a very important antioxidant. Um, and then another one I take is R-alpha-lipoic acid. It's important it's R, not L. So capital R-alpha-lipoic acid. This is an antioxidant and cofactor for the mitochondrial respiratory enzymes. I take 240 milligrams of that daily, right? Now, besides sun exposure, or I should say near infrared light exposure and supplements, another thing we can do to improve the health of our mitochondria is to make changes in our diet. And the first step here is to decrease our consumption of seed oils. I'm talking about corn oil, canola oil, soybean oil, cottonseed oil, sunflower, safflower oil, grapeseed oil, and so on. Now, these are very rich in omega-6 fatty acids. These are polyunsaturated fats, very rich in omega-6 fatty acids. And omega-6 you know, fatty acids are difficult for us. Now, we used to have a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fats of about one to one in our hunter-gatherer times, and that was ideal for our bodies. Today, it's 20 to one. So we're having um, way too many omega-6 fats that we take in. Now, the issues with these is that they're disproportionately stored in our mitochondria, and there they can elicit insulin resistance and mitochondrial dysfunction. We can't use them easily as fuel. They're mostly like uh, signaling and structural molecules. So we need some of them, but we, we're taking in way too much of them. There's also an issue in how they are produced. Now, if they are expeller expressed, that's better, but a lot of them are chemically extracted. And this is a whole chemical factory that makes these. It's, these are not very good oils, just based on that alone, but then also because of their high omega-6 content. So <clears throat> unfortunately, they're in all of our fast foods. Highly processed foods always have omega-6 fatty acids and there. You can look at it. There'll be soybean oil, canola oil in, in all processed foods that you can buy in a supermarket. So what some people do then, they increase the intake of omega-3 fat, which is fine to do. I did a video just warning about if we get uh, omega-3, for example, from fish oil, make sure it's an unoxidized fish oil. And then it's actually beneficial and good for you. 
many fish oils are oxidized. So check the label. Uh, it should be third-party tested and ideally IFOS certified. And then you usually have a good one and then look at the expiration date. But besides increasing omega-3, I think it's a good step to decrease, again, our consumption of omega-6 to get that ratio better. And that's actually highly beneficial for mitochondrial health. Now, you can replace these seed oils with um, small amounts. Remember, not too much fat, but some fat is okay. Of avocado oil, olive oil, or butter, or ghee, if you want to be fancy. <clears throat> now, avocado oil and even olive oil, be careful. Many of these oils, even if it says 100% avocado oil on the bottle, have been cut with cheap soybean oil and other oils. There's a big scam going on. The one oil that I found in studies that did fairly well it's, uh, uh, is an oil, <clears throat> an avocado oil that is called Chosen. And you can get this in the supermarket. Most supermarkets will have this. That's one of the better ones there, right? The same goes for olive oil. So a second step is to avoid simple sugars and decrease our total carbohydrate intake to less than about 150 grams per day, in my opinion. For some people, if you're struggling with type 2 diabetes, for example, I would try to get even under that, net, close to like 100 grams per day if you can. <clears throat> now, simple sugars or higher amounts of carbohydrates in general can overwhelm the mitochondria by inducing them to overproduce ATP. And this, again, is equivalent to a solar roof that is exposed to massive amounts of sunlight day and night. And ultimately, this leads to heating up and burning of wires and destruction of the storage battery, right? So decreasing simple sugars and carbohydrates greatly helps the mitochondria to limit the energy production to a healthy level without causing excessive production of free radicals and other damaging molecules, right? Other steps we can do to optimize our mitochondria, make them healthier, is fasting. This usually starts at around 16 hours. So if you do a 16 to 20 hour fast once a week, that's great. Better benefits, of course, if you fast longer than that, something on the order of two or three days. But for most people, that's difficult to do. But if you pick a day a week where you go for an 18 to 20 hour fast, this is already very beneficial and can give you benefits in terms of mitochondrial health. It helps with weeding out, you know, old cells and old mitochondria that are not functioning well, and it stimulates the production of new mitochondria. So that's an easy thing to do. If we want to increase our mitochondrial content in our muscle tissue, we can do this by inducing muscle hypertrophy through exercising, building more muscle, right? Resistance training. And that is something where when you think of our muscle cells, they don't divide, but they can increase in size. They can incorporate more protein. And at the same time, they will also incorporate larger amounts of mitochondria. So this is another thing we can do to increase mitochondrial number and mitochondrial health, at least in those tissues, right? Um, and then lastly, very important and highly um, under uh, talked about or underrated is sleep. Seven to nine hours per night is my recommendation, but I'm talking about good sleep here, not one of those things where you wake up all night and you feel lousy in the morning. Good quality sleep. And um, here there's a supplement that I'm taking that has really been a game changer for me. It's been a huge change in my daily energy levels and my uh, brain function and overall brain health, I would argue. And that is something called Remade, and I'm going to link this in the description. It has um, several uh, sleep supplements in there that are frequently talked about uh, by, you know, Andrew Huberman, for example, um, that are very beneficial for our, our uh, for good sleep and for sleep that is regenerative overnight. So there are differences in how you sleep. This is something that I think is hugely helpful. At least it was very helpful for me. You can read this up in the description. So again, these are the steps that I think are good. Again, you don't have to always go to supplements. Sun exposure, um, dietary changes can make a big impact on mitochondrial health and thereby helping your immune system to pick up and, and just overall making you healthier, more energetic, and hopefully also sleeping better throughout the night. So if this was helpful, um, please leave a comment and uh, subscribe. I check those and I'm highly interested to see what supplements you're taking for the purpose of improving mitochondrial health of improving your immune system, what has worked for you and what supplements have not worked for you. And I'd love to discuss this.